classification. Professor Jairaman obtained his PhD in simulations of chemical reactors from the University of Pune and is currently a distinguished professor and an emeritus scientist at the Flames University. His academia expertise expands across several areas such as computer sciences, machine learning and bioinformatics. He's also advising sheep for bioclues and is attached to many academic organizations where he actively takes part in imparting knowledge to the youth. It is my great honor to invite Professor Valadi to deliver his address. Thank you very much for uh, the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk uh, in this uh, conference. Uh, I also thank the person who introduced me. Uh, thanks a lot. So I will now start the lecture. Yeah. Hope you are able to see my screen. Um, yes, sir. We can see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, what do I mm, just a minute? Okay. Just a sec. Right. So, today I'm going to talk, and hope you are able to hear me clearly. Hello. Um, yes, sir. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I'm going to talk on um, protein function identification a little bit. It's very difficult to talk on this subject uh, in about uh, half an hour, but uh, let me try to give you a, a glimpse of uh, the idea of uh, identifying protein functions from a set of sequences or structures. Yeah. So it uh, this contains a few steps. The first step is to extract the, the most informative domain attributes. And um, when you collect a, a large number of different domain attributes, you have to select the attributes which have the highest possible information content. So that is going to be attribute selection. Once you select the best attributes, you use these attributes as input to the classifier to identify a particular sequence is going to have a protein function or not. This is going to be a supervised learning methodology. So once you have a model with the a set of sequences which are having a certain function or sequences which do not have certain functions. This model can be used to identify a new query sequence, whether it is going to have this function or not. So once you, so this uh, process of uh, getting the model uh, involves in proposing various models and classifiers and discriminate and ev between different models and then test different models and then evaluate the best possible model and select the final model, which can then be used for further testing of new sequences. Yeah. So in the first step, we have to extract the most informative attributes given a set of sequences or structures. So this uh, conventionally, these attributes normally used are amino acid frequencies, or dipeptide frequencies, tripeptide frequencies and a set of KMR frequencies where K equal to more than three. So uh, we can also employ a remote homology uh, based PSSM matrix, uh, which is uh, which provides you the information about the ev evolutionary connection between distantly uh, connected sequences. So we can also provide information about motives, number of motives as well as uh, uh, the uh, qualitative and quantitative informations. We can provide secondary structure information if it's available. We can also extract various physicochemical properties like the hydrophobic, hydrophilic, charge, etc. And then the AA index contains a list of about uh, around 600 attribute properties. So we can extract, uh, if you have domain information for a particular function identification problem, you can extract uh, the relevant properties which you think it may be very useful. Otherwise, extract most of the physical chemical properties and use the machine learning algorithm for select the most informative physical chemical properties. 
Finally, you can provide, if you've got structures available, you can provide structural features like surface accessibility, atom coordinates, distance between different uh, uh, atoms, and then contact order like that. Yeah. So once you put in geometry properties, there are various ways of uh, uh, extracting the information about the properties. Uh, you can get the grand average of a given index over the sequence. That can be taken as a future. And this can be done for different uh, properties. Yeah. You can also provide secondary structure information. So it can be obtained from the DSSP, uh, uh, this thing, uh, software. So the extended seven different uh, secondary structure attributes can be provided. Or conventionally, we also can provide information about uh, the three secondary structures like helix, strand, and then turn. So given a uh, sequence of uh, 20 letter alphabet, we can extract the secondary structure information, which gives you from the 20 letters to three letters. So every possible amino acid, uh, whether it is going to be, a, uh, this, this is part of a helix or part of a strand or turn. So you can convert the 20 letter into three letters, one, two, three. So this three letter word compression is more useful than the original 20 letter alphabet. So this uh, three letter alphabet can be input as uh, a future to the machine learning algorithm to provide information about a particular sequence. Yeah. So we can also provide accessible surface area. So an access program can be used to get the surface area, which can be quite useful in uh, this uh, attribute will be very useful in uh, uh, local uh, binding type uh, function identification problems. We can also provide a contact order of a residue in a folded protein. Which, it can be defined as a number of amino acids that lie within a defined radius around that amino acid. So this, this information also can be used for uh, local binding uh, type functions. Yeah. We can provide FISA angles information and uh, more uh, information about distances of different atoms. The distance matrix itself can be employed as, uh, as, a, as a most informative attribute for uh, providing information about the structure of uh, a particular protein sequence. Yeah. You can also compress uh, two or three properties together so and reduce alphabets in terms of that. So like we can say if a given sequence, you can reduce the alphabet in terms of charge as negatively charged, uh, neutral or positively charged. So this again, 20 letter alphabet can be reduced into three, three letter alphabet by using a particular physicochemical property. We can further combine, as I said, two different properties together, like hydrophobicity and charge together we can add. So we can say a given particular, uh, this thing, uh, amino acid is hydrophobic, is it hydrophobic positive, hydrophobic negative, hydrophobic uncharged, or hydrophilic positive, hydroph hydrophilic negative, or hydrophobic uncharged. So this sort of uh, combining two different prop properties together may be very useful again in local binding type function identification problems. This sort of uh, two tuple alphabet can be done for various uh, different properties uh, like charge in volume, charge in mass, volume and mass. You can also increase a tuple to three tuple and multiple tuples, tuples are also possible. Yeah. So there are many different uh, uh, features apart from what I have described can be extracted like you can extract network attributes from sequences if you can use a network if as a, if you can represent the sequence as a network then you can extract network attributes so once these attributes are all selected we have a compendium of attributes from a compendium of attributes we must now find out the most informative attributes which which has the maximum correlation to the particular functional um, function identification problem. So this step is now normally known as a pre-processing step of attribute selection or future selection. So the attribute selection is uh, useful because you can train the algorithm faster because if you have a compendium of attributes which uh, can be very large, for example, in uh, 
and protein function identification problem, we can extract uh, uh, until 10,000 attributes. So using a, a classifier with all the 10,000 attributes uh, may be very slow. Secondly, they are, all of them may not have the uh, information content for the particular problem at hand. So once you reduce the attributes, the interpretation is also easy. You can improve accuracy. It also reduces overfitting. Again, we can get that if if uh, very few attributes, the top ranking attributes we can identify, then they can be used as a biomarker. So it provides valuable domain knowledge. Yeah. So there are essentially two different attribute selection methodologies. They are known as filter methods and wrapper methods. So filter methods, so once you use this method, you can the output of the method is in ranking information about the features. If you got 100 features, you can get ranking about each feature. So uh, feature rank one, two, three, like that. Once you rank the attributes, you can use the top ranked attributes as your input to the classifier and can, can use them and then build a model for classification to identify a particular function. Yeah. So uh, in the filter methods, uh, there is no need to use a, a machine learning algorithm again and again. It's very easy to implement fast and scalable, but the problem is it's not very accurate. There are various methods uh, uh, filter ranking. Now in the wrapper method, uh, we don't rank the attributes, but we have to use a classifier repeatedly to get the most informative attributes. We can again get uh, uh, from a, a large number of attributes, you can reduce the attribute list to a smaller set, which has the maximum correlation. It's computationally intensive. Performance strongly depends upon the particular classifier used. So it provides much higher accuracy and then compared to the filter methods. So there are various methods known as forward selection, backward selection, surface selection. They can all they can also use embedded methodologies where filter and wrapper methods can be combined together in one algorithm. And we can also use uh, recently the evolutionary, stochastic, evolutionary and heuristic methods have been used profusely for attribute selection. So these methods include genetic algorithms and colony optimization, simulated and annealing, and various uh, swarm-based methods. Yeah. So the filter methods, uh, if you have a set of, uh, for uh, as an example, you've got five attributes. Uh, if you use the SVM cl classifier with all the attributes, the accuracy may be very low. And then if you use a filter ranking method and find the top three ranking attributes and then input these top ranking attributes which have the highest correlation to the particular problem at hand, then the accuracy can increase. So use only the selected features and then the selection can be done by filter ranking by using filter methods. There are multiple filter ranking methods like correlation filter, mutual information, information gain, chi-square chi -square method for feature selection. So the very different methods are available. There's uh, the embedded methods uh, combines the quality of the filter and wrapper method. And uh, this is uh, several algorithms have in their own uh, built-in feature selection methodologies uh, in their model, embedded in their model. So they have a deeper connection to the learning algorithms and part of the classification itself. They are less time consuming because you can simultaneously get a future attribute selection and then you can also run the classification. So methods like support vector machines, random forest, lasso and ridge can be used as embedded methods. The tool in evolution algorithms can be employed for future selection. So many different algorithms are available, genetic algorithms and colony optimization, uh, swarm based algorithms, uh, black hole algorithm like that, different methodologies are available. The motivation to use evolution algorithms are very easy to implement. You don't need derivative information to, to get the to get the most optimal subset of attributes from a large compendium of features. Sampling a subset of a solution and then get you can get the, a near global optimum uh, ranked solutions. Yeah. So, so once you extract the most informative attributes of future, future selection, you input these attributes to different classifiers, find out the accuracies by, by using a test train validation model, 
where you use a test and train to tune the parameters and then you validate for the unseen examples. So like that you do with different classification models and then find out the performance measure. The performance can, measure can be accuracy, it can be uh, um, ROC, it can be Mackey correlation coefficient, it can be positive accuracy, it can be negative accuracy and so on. So every particular problem requires a particular performance measure. So you have to tune the algorithm parameters. Each of the algorithms used in the classi classification must be tuned for the parameters by using the test train and validation uh, set uh, formalism. And once you do that, you get the most uh, the most useful and, and the highly high performance classifier. And that classifier has to be used as final model. And then this model can be used for testing uh, new sequences. And then once you get experimentally tested sequences, uh, you can add these sequences and then rebuild the model for, and further refine the model and rebuild. So these are the identification steps. There are different kinds of uh, algorithms are available for classification. And uh, the algorithm can be decision tree, random forest, supported machines, various uh, neural network uh, methodologies, and then deep learning methods. So due to lack of time, I'll just mention about support vector machines and uh, random forest. Support vector machines uh, was introduced by Wapnix and co-workers in 1992. It's rigorously based on statistical learning theory. And because SVM is uh, very effective, it is used to solve real problems in different areas of science and uh, engineering. So they're also, it's also used in chemo and bioinformatics profusely and many, many other fields. Yeah. So SVM uses a linear hyperplane for classifi classifying examples which are linearly classifiable. So what it does is it, it finds out the hyperplane which maximizes the distance between the closest examples belonging to two different classes. It's essentially a maximum margin linear hyperplane algorithm. So you can you can uh, find out the margin to be equal to the norm of the weight vectors. So to maximize the margin, you have to minimize the norm of the weight vectors. And we can show that this, this can be formulated as a quadratic optimization problem. So the a quadratic optimization problem has, has, got a, has got a very desirable property of uh, having only one particular local, uh, only one particular minima uh, in, uh, unlike other methodologies like neural network, which can get stuck up into local minima. So you may get stuck up into a low performing model if you use other algorithms, whereas in support of machines, it always uh, uh, gives you the best possible, only one unique global solution, yeah. <clears throat> so if the examples are not linearly classifiable, what NCVM does is it, it, it maps the data into higher dimensional attribute space and then it uses a linear classifier in that attribute space. So because uh, it becomes computationally interactive for uh, problems with large number of uh, uh, attributes, uh, SVM defines different kernel functions. And by virtue of defining kernel functions, all the problems can be carried out in the original space itself. So SVM now for nonlinear classifiable problems is a linear classifier in a higher dimensional attribute space. And by virtue of uh, using appropriate kernels, all the computations can be done in the original space itself. Yeah, random forest. Random forest is another very high performance model, which is very profusely used in different fields. Random forest is a forest of decision trees. Several decision tree models together are taken and then uh, voting methodology is used to get the final model. So a decision tree, uh, as you, it starts with the head node, and then in the head node, the most informative attribute is split at the most informative point, and so on. And at every intermediate nodes and the final leaf node, uh, the, the informative attribute is found out for splitting. Once this is done, you've got a complete model. So once the model is built, we can use that as uh, a set of uh, rules, like if the in this particular decision tree model, you can say if the descriptor one is less than 0.05, then the, <coughs> the, the example is not active. If the descriptor is greater than or equal to 0.05 and descriptor three is 
greater than or equal to 0.03, then it is an active. Like that, you can, once you build a decision tree model, you can get a set of rules, and then you can apply each of the test examples sent through the decision tree and get a decision uh, whether it's going to be active or inactive. So now random forest is a collection of decision trees. There are two different randomness introduced in the random forest. One is bootstrap sampling with replacement, and the second is uh, at every node, uh, each tree uses a subset of attributes instead of using all the attributes for node splitting. So with this randomness introduced, uh, each decision tree will provide one decision for every given example, and all the trees together, the majority voting is done, and the final model is uh, now uh, evaluated. Uh, um, final model is uh, got from this, yeah. So the random forest is very easy to parallelize. It's a very simple model with only two parameters. You can also have I, I find out the attribute importance, which can be used for attribute selection. So there's an embedded methodology is there in random forest itself. There is no need for separate cross validation. That's because in each tree we can have what is known as an out of bag examples, and then these out of bag examples can themselves be used as test examples. So can can handle missing values and then provides very very good accuracies and high performance. Yeah. So in the so the, the third part of this talk, I'll talk of, uh, about our recent work on uh, reduced alphabet RA to VEC, the reduced alphabet methodology of distributed representation of protein sequences for identifying protein functions. So how much time I have? Can anyone tell me, please? Yeah, so that I will. Uh... Uh, you have about 25 minutes, sir. Please. Yeah. Another 25 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, to identify the pro protvec distributed representation of protein sequences and reduced alphabet distributed representation of protein sequences, for functional identification, we have to start with uh, the text. So the NLP and text uh, categorization methodologies, so machines cannot understand text. So if you are going to classify different texts into different classes, like you want to classify text into um, text which belong, documents which belong, which talk about science, documents which talk about politics, documents which talk about sports. So it's a three class problem. So what we do is all the documents are pulled together and a corpus of all the words are found out, non-repeating words are found out. This corpus can run into a large number of uh, words. So this, we have to encode the text into numbers. So this, this encoding needs to be unique for every text. So for example, there is a one heart encoding can be done. So if if the corpus here is, is corpus is of a certain length, so the attribute, the future representation vector length will be the total number of words in the corpus. Here, let us assume this is the corpus. So the total number of words are equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, three, six, and four, ten. The corpus is now of 10 words. So each word will be assigned one position and that if a word is occurring in a given document, that position will be filled with one, otherwise it will, it will be filled with zero. So this is how uh, a, a sentence can be represented, the corpus can be represented. And then for each word, there is a particular uh, representation. So. So this, uh, this particular representation is a huge vector representation and then uh, very sparse and the numerical representation is very sparse. So there are various uh, methodologies we can use TF-IDF term frequency and inverse document frequency methodologies to find out the number of times the a particular term is occurring. You can use the term frequency along with the inverse document frequency uh, as an attribute for a particular problem at hand and then for a given word and then use these attributes as input to the classifier. That's possible. But we can also use singular value de decomposition, which is a somewhat uh, alternate method uh, of uh, like your PCA. Yeah. Now, 
how to build a simple scalable fast to train models which can run over billions of words that will produce ex exceedingly good word representations so uh, recently Mikola et al thought about this and then they built what is known as a word to vec model so the word to vec model derives relations between a word and its contextual words so represent each word with a low dimensional vector what it means is every word is given a vector representation the vector can be of particular size it can be a size of 300 300 uh, um, uh, vector size can be 300 400 500 so a particular length vector representation for each word is extracted now the key idea is it you can predict the surrounding words of every word uh, from a given word or from the surrounding words you can predict a given word so once you do that using a very shallow network you will be able to capture the relationships in the algebraic representations so so the word to work what it does is your entire set of uh, corpus each word if you have got a word then there are two different methodologies in the Thibo methodology, you can use uh, the surrounding words of a particular window size. A window size of uh, surrounding words can be 5, 10, 15, like that. Those words as input in a shallow neural network with only one hidden layer. And then you use this, use this hidden layer, the summed weight vectors are summed up and then this is now used to predict a given word. So the surrounding words are used as input. You predict the word. Like uh, if uh, for a fox is the word, you give the surrounding words three, D quick brown and jumped over the. So the window size of six words which are surrounding is used as input to predict the word fox. So like this, in the SIBO methodology, the surrounding words are used as input to a shallow neural network, one layer. And then the weighted input is now sent to the hidden layer. And then you can use your neural network methodology of activating function and then predict your central word. So this is done for the entire set of uh, corpus in your text documents for a particular set of documents. And then this. Uh, now this hidden layers, now the weights, learned weights now are the embedded vectors of a particular size now. This size depends upon the number of neurons in the hidden layer. So this embedded vectors is shown to represent a particular word. For every word you can get this embedding vector and then this embedding vector can then be used as, in, as input to any particular classification problem. So this this getting this uh, for every word you get a vector of a particular size and this embedding vectors is known as is is found to have good semantic and syntactic information and this is known as a continuous distributed representation this vector is known as a continuous distributed representation for your the corpus so this is a SIBO method the skip gram method Every word is used as input to the hidden layer of particular size. And the weights are learned for each word so that the surrounding words of a particular uh, window size is predicted for each of the words. So this is uh, so that the prediction probability is maximized. So if you train the neural network of one particular layer, only one layer, to maximize the probability of prediction of the surrounding words for all the words. So once this is done, the embedding, the vectors obtained for each word of a particular size, which depends upon the hidden layer size, is used as input for any classification problem. So this is the word to work idea. And yeah, this is what I said. Every word now, every word is now used as a one heart uh, vector. And then that one heart vector of each word is used as input to the hidden layer. And then you have an output of the surrounding uh, words prediction for each word. Yeah. And this hidden layer weights, the weights learned are used as embedding vectors, as I said. Yeah. So, 
So for every word, you have uh, a set of embedding vectors. Once you do this, it is found, as I said, similar words have are found to be um, put in uh, very in the neighborhood in, in the space in the vector space so the king and queen are found to be very near man and woman are found to be very near like that different uh, words of uh, a particular similar words are found to be uh, put in the space in the neighborhood so this uh, idea can be used in function identification examples with uh, Similar similar examples can be uh, uh, found out. The similarity of the examples can be found out as we can be used as uh, methodology to find out the functions of different uh, um, uh, text mine text words as well as uh, the same idea can be used for protein function identification. The word the idea is to get for every corp, every word in the corpus, a set of vector representation, which is known as distributed representation of vectors, which is known as embedded vectors. These embedded vectors can be used as input for every particular word. And then this can be further, it can be updated for a given document by averaging the uh, vectors of each word. And then those vectors can be representing represented as attributes for a given document and that that can be used for uh, as an input to any classifier. So this is a methodology of word to vec. This has been used in different uh, text mining applications like sen uh, sentiment analysis and then large number of uh, different um, classification problems in NLP. Now, this, so, <coughs> so, right. um, so the skip gram methodology is to use the word to predict the surrounding words. SIBO is, is to use the surrounding word to predict the central word. So in, in our methodology, in so of reduced alphabet distributed representation of protein sequences, we have used the skip gram methodology where <coughs> I'll give you the complete idea. So the protein, uh, <coughs> So RIT VEC is a data-driven distributed representation for biological sequences with the 20 letter alphabets reduced based on hydropathy and confirmation similarity. So it is inspired by word to vec and prot vec. How, let me first explain how prot vec was uh, put in, uh, I'll tell you, yeah. Uh, right. As Gary and Mofrat first applied the word to vec model for distributed representation and for loyal dimensional informative future extraction to handle biological sequences. So in this representation, each word, as, we, as I said, is embedded in vector with similar words having proximate vectors in the embedded space. So now, what? Uh, how do we apply this word to vec formalism to protein sequences? It was originally done by Asgari and Mofret. What he did was he used entire Swiss broad words as corpus. And for so for every camer, this camer can be uh, adjusted. So the best possible camer can be tuned as an algorithm parameter to give the highest possible accuracy. So let us consider the camer as a trimmer currently. So using for every camer of a given sequence, in this, every camer, this thing for every sequence, you can use uh, the Swiss broad this thing uh, corpus words to get the embedding vectors extracted and then you can use it to uh, for every sequence to uh, sum it up some of the embedding vectors can be used as attributes for a given sequence yeah so in the process of extracting embedding vector embedding for protein sequences we have what we have done is instead of using the 20 letter alphabet we use we reduce the alphabet in terms of hydropathy and confirmation similarity so the alphabets now are reduced to uh, five different alphabets and each group, depending upon the hydropathy values, highest to lowest, the 20 letter alphabet is now reduced to five letters based on this grouping. Similarly, based on confirmation similarity, we have grouped them into uh, different uh, groups. So these grouped alphabet now, is, is now, as I said, convert the Swiss sequences into reduced alphabet based on hydropathy. 
After that, the converted residue solvent version of sequence into K sets of shifted non overlapping K grams. So, what we do is the original sequence is now reduced in terms of the reduced alphabets. Now, the reduced alphabets of now are the, this, uh, this capital, I'll call this capital A, B, C, D, and E. So, every sequence now is reduced now with this reduced alphabet represented. So, you have now we have three different shifted versions of the original version is DCA, CCA, D, and shifted by one alphabet. Now we got the next representation. So, so the words now for a given sequence now, these are the words for each of the sequences. Yeah. So K sets of now we have got three sets of shift, no, overlap, no overlapping three grams as shown in this figure. So you carry out the same procedure for all the annotated cisplot sequences. For every sequence, you do this. So you employ the skip gram embedding model to create the embedding vectors with the setting similar to that of uh, used by the original protvec, which is again inspired by the vertvec methodology. So create the reduced alphabet with embedding vectors for confirmation similarity, similarly based uh, as as done in hydropathy. So so in this case you. Uh, convert to the original into reduced alphabet based on confirmation similarity. Once you reduce alphabets, now use this methodology for the entire Swiss uh, set of sequences to get the embedding vectors for each sequence. And these sequences can now be converted into feature vectors. It can be used by any classifier for uh, classification methodology, similar to the methodology we use normally in using the KMERS like uh, amino acid frequencies, etc. So once this is done, so what we had done is we had created the different embedding models with different k-gram size and vector size. And for each of the sets of seven different ways of future extraction were used. I will tell you about the seven different ways now in the next slide. After generating the, the attribute sets, we have used uh, recursive future elimination, future selection. And once you, the reduced set of futures are now used as an input to the classifier. And then we used five-fold class validation measure as the performance measure to optimize the the algorithm parameters for SVM. So we've used uh, PMERS and FIMERS, different vector sizes were given for each, uh, for original protvec, we hydropathy and confirmation similarity. So we used uh, seven different models. Only the original protvec sequences, embedded vectors were used as input to SVM, this is model number one. Then Hydropathy reduced embedded vectors were used as input. Then conformational similarity grouped embedded vectors were used as input. Now we combine both hydropathy and confirmation similarity as the fourth model. Hydropathy and protvec as the fifth model. Confirmation similarity and protvec as sixth model. And finally, we used all the three uh, models: the original protvec along with the reduced alphabet formalisms for hydropathy and confirmation similarity. Seven different models were used. And the extracted vectors were used as input to the SVM classifier, and we used class validation measure to maximize uh, the algorithm performance by tuning the parameters. So, very quickly, I will go to the results and say for all the data set combinations, the reduced alphabet uh, models of hydropathy and confirmation similarity, along with perform, perform the best. That means the combined models gave the best, giving significant improvement over the original protvec uh, methodology of emitting vectors. Even hydropathy and protvec and confirmation similarity with protvec, hydropathy with protvec and confirmation similarity with protvec, this, these two combinations also provided a significant performance over standalone protvec. So, and except for one particular data set, the ra 2 vec models of hydropathy and confirmation similarity, even without protvec, performed better than the standalone protvec. So, this methodology was used for several uh, conventional function identification problem, which include antimicrobial peptides, antifungal peptides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we found out our reduced alphabet methodologies provided significant improvement over the original original methodology of inputting uh, the attributes uh, like physicochemical properties or uh, chemical frequencies, like amino acid frequencies, or even the standalone protvec. So for uh, different uh, function identification problem, if you have a, if you have domain information about uh, a particular physicochemical property being useful, we can reduce the alphabets into different groups and can use this reduced alphabet formalism of distributed uh, uh, 
protein vector representation to identify protein functions. I think I'll stop with this and I'll take questions. Thanks a lot for giving me an opportunity to talk here again. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, so I would kindly like to request the audience to ask any questions, if there are any questions. I am open to questions, please. Yeah. Yes, um, any questions? Sir, uh, I just have uh, one question. I mean, uh, perhaps a very uh, stupid question. Uh, sir, how do you think that this model could work for hypothetical proteins? Because, you know, uh, if if uh, if rat rat two vec you know could could probably be used with certain you know features you know that uh, you know that that could be you know surpassed or that could already be uh, used you know with uh, say hypothetical proteins. Yeah, so hypothetical proteins, yes, uh, you can have a combination of different uh, reduced alpha vet, uh, uh, embedding vectors with different properties and then try to again use an attribute selection to get the most informative attributes and use. I think it will, in my opinion, uh, for hypothetical proteins, it may work well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for an excellent talk. We'll probably uh, use this, you know, for a model. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and uh, we have quite reached the end of the first session. Before we start on the second session, uh, there will be a small buffer time with uh, networking. So um, I think over to you, uh, Vinod, for that. I think we should uh, thank uh, the, the first two keynote speakers with a big round of applause, please. Maybe you know we should all unmute our microphones and... Uh, Maybe, uh, you know, this applause you know, should also be heard uh, somewhere in Pune and uh, as well in Hong Kong, where Scott is. Yeah, please unmute your microphone and uh, probably let's uh, thank the speakers with a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So we have a small change in the program. So uh, I believe, you know, the two invited speakers, you know, uh, uh, Pr uh, Pritish and uh, Sachini, Sachini Fernando, uh, unfortunately, I think both of them are not there. Uh, maybe uh, I would request uh, uh, Nishche and uh, the team, you know, maybe you know, to have a kind of a quick round of introduction during that session, as you please, yeah. Um, could you please repeat? I think my network went down. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Now, yeah. I was just wondering that, you know, the, first, uh, the, the two, uh, the two uh, invited speakers, Pritish yeah. and uh, Sachini Fernando, uh, yeah. both of them are missing today. They're not uh, right. speaking. So okay. maybe I, I would request you to, you know, have a kind, kind of in a quick uh, introductory session of uh, mm -hmm. all the participants, you know, what, what they're up to, you know, during that particular break. Okay, sure. So uh, when we start the second session, we may we could have a quick uh, introductory session. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, we have about twenty-one minutes. Yeah. Thank you so yes. much. All right.